Uh, thank you. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 1852 in the name of Gillian Martin on celebrating flexible working practices. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I uh, could ask those leaving in the public gallery please to do so quietly. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Gillian Martin to open this debate. Ms Martin, seven minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The reason I put together a motion for a member's debate on flexible working was to highlight how it can not only improve the lives of many workers, but it can improve productivity of businesses and organisations. Everyone is entitled to ask for flexible working arrangements, and by law every organisation must consider such requests, but they can do more than that. In, a recent, in recent research carried out by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, 66% of Scottish women felt unable to ask for flexible working arrangements for fear of a negative response. And 29% of that number said that it was because they were afraid of their colleagues' reaction. Others cited fear of employment discrimination, like having responsibilities taken off them or not being considered for promotion as if asking for flexible working would mark them out as not having the same work ethic or commitment to the job as their colleagues. And I reckon that it's even harder for a man to ask for flexible working, and they probably worry even more about facing these attitudes because of traditional, old-fashioned expectations on them. I strongly want to make the point that flexible working isn't just for mums. If we want a truly equal society, then a change in attitudes to the needs that fathers have to a flexible work to fully share in their parenting responsibilities is absolutely key. But more than that, you shouldn't have to be a parent or have caring responsibilities to make a case for flexible working, as it has benefits for everyone, and not just the employees, the businesses too. Nearly 20 years ago, I worked in a company which was undergoing their investors and people assessment. And quite a few of us employees decided that we would ask the managing director if he would consider implementing flexible work working practices. All we wanted was a flexible start and end time to the working day. Core office hours were 9am to 5.30pm, but you could opt to start your day any time between 7 and 10am and end it between 4 and 6.30pm. As long as you worked your monthly hours and you didn't miss any schedules, appointments or meetings, you had that flexibility. The MD was very sceptical. He was convinced that it would be abused, that folk would swing the lead, that it was, would adversely affect productivity of the company. But in absolute fairness to him, he said he'd allow a six-month pilot. At the end of the pilot, he called an all-staff meeting and announced his thoughts after he and his management team had done an analysis. His top line was this, I thought I'd lose out, but you're all actually working harder for me and you all seem happier. Here's what happened in that six months. The productivity of staff actually rose. It seemed that staff managed their time better. People did not swing the lead. No one did less than their contracted hours. In fact, many actually did more. There was a drop in the amount of staff taking time out of the day for appointments, like doctor's or dentist appointments, and it turns out they were using their flexi time for that. Sick leave had halved. People were less stressed. For one thing, they, could, they were not battling through the rush hour traffic every day or spending as long in their cars if they could choose to journey in at a time when the traffic wasn't as heavy. All the work didn't just get done, it got done faster. If you had come in at 7 a.m., you'd be delivering work ahead of schedule. And it turned out that the earlier start was the preferred option of most of the staff. And that was just the short-term effects. Studies have shown that employees are less likely to leave a job with flexible working hours to find alternative employment. Employees feel more trusted and, as a result, more valued, so they stick around. These studies also show that flexible workers are less likely to call in sick. In the world of work, one of the major overheads is recruitment and retention. Another is time lost due to sick leave. And flexibility isn't just about start time. It can also be about working from home. If the work's of a nature that it matters not where it's done, then what is the harm of working from home? And what this, might this mean in terms of opening up the world of work to people with mobility issues 
or caring responsibilities? How might their productivity be increased as a result of the availability of this time and location flexibility? And I want businesses to think of this. Do you advertise your vacant positions as being flexible? And if not, do you realise how many more people would apply? What a larger pool of talent you'd have to choose from. Highly qualified people who might be finding it hard to find a job that fits in with their caring responsibilities might prioritise a flexible working schedule over, say, some of the more costly perks that you might otherwise offer to entice the best of the skills market to your door. And I'd like to encourage businesses and organisations who already have flexible working in place to shout about it more. Tell the world how it's benefited your organisation. Encourage others to adopt your successful practices. The entries for the Scottish Top Employers for Working Family Award uh, closed this week, and I'm told that there's a record number of entries this year. And I'll be watching closely to see which organisation wins the best for innovation in family-friendly and flexible working category. Here's betting their staff turnover figures are the stuff dreams are made of. I'm proud to say that now, as an MSP, who, like everyone else in this chamber, is an employer to staff, that I offer flexible work. My wonderful parliamentary assistant, Judith, works flexibly around her university teaching commitments. You see, you offer flexible work, you get smart people. My two office managers job share and can work from home if they wish. And don't tell them this, but I reckon I get more out of them by having these arrangements that fit in with their busy lives. Claire and Gwyneth work tremendously hard for me. As does Duncan, who doesn't feel the need to work flexibly, but might one day. By offering flexible working, I get the best out of my staff, and so could other employers if they took the leap. Just like my cynical old MD all those years ago. Thank you very much. I'm sure your staff have enjoyed these compliments. May look for wage rises now that you've said they're so good. Um, I now call on open debate, so it's Liam Kerr to be followed by Rona Mackay. Mr Kerr, four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank Gillian Martin for bringing this debate and the motion. I come at this motion firstly as a Scottish Conservative, so core to my personal philosophy is productivity, a healthy economy, retention of talent and promotion of the family, however individuals choose to compose and formalise it. So I'm pleased that this motion talks of encouraging a more productive workforce and suggests that family-friendly workplaces can help Scotland reach its full economic potential. It is not news to groups like Family Friendly Working Scotland, which promote flexible working practices, that many studies show that good work-life balance is one of the most important aspects of work to British workforce. Others show flexible working environments attract, motivate and retain employees, increase employee satisfaction and maintain employee productivity. So I am comfortable that to promote flexible working and prioritise employee well-being is to promote productivity and realisation of economic potential. But secondly, I come at this from the other aspect of this motion, to, quote, help Scotland reach its full economic potential by allowing women to stay act active in the economy. True, but let's not restrict it to women. I think Gillian Martin made exactly that point, and I endorse her comments on that entirely. But I'd like to tell a story. A few years ago, a constituent approached his employer, a law firm for whom he'd worked for a number of years at a senior level, delivering considerable value, winning internal and external awards, consistently exceeding billing targets and client wins. He had a small child and felt that it was important that his child got as much time with both parents as possible, that his wife had as much right to resume her professional career, and that there was no compelling reason that his wife should be required to play the greater role in childcare. Not choices everyone would or indeed could make, but right for his family. Now he requested a simple change in work pattern, start half an hour later to allow the nursery drop off, finish an hour earlier to allow the nursery pick up, work from home in the evenings to make up the time, and work from home on the Friday when the child was not at nursery. The employer shut down the conversation. You are not getting flexible working. This discussion is not going further, and it didn't. And that day, the firm lost that lawyer. 
Now, fortunately, and perhaps unusually, as what follows is not an option for so many, our lawyer was sufficiently skilled, experienced, and confident to resign and set up on his own, delivering the same services to clients, but under the pattern he'd suggested. The new company was extraordinarily successful. Clients preferred it. Response times were quicker, more 24-hour. Technology meant he could work anywhere at any time. Productivity rocketed. The wife was able to commit fully to her own career again, re-entering the labour market. Family life was happier, healthier, and accorded with their values. And all for the sake of an hour and a half's flexibility and trusting an employee enough to work from home. For that, the firm lost talent it had invested a lot of money in. That employer had failed to appreciate that facing a choice between work and family, not everyone will be forced to choose work. And thus it's my view that flexible, family-friendly practices are good for productivity, the economy, the promotion of family values, and allowing everyone to remain more active in the economy. And any group which promotes such practices is to be commended, as Gillian Martin's motion calls on the Parliament to do. Thank you. I, I, I think the question on all our lips was, that was that you? <laughs> <laughs> That's an even better answer. Uh, I now call on Rona Mackay to be followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to speak in this debate today, and I thank my colleague Gillian Martin for bringing it to the Chamber. Presiding Officer, as Gillian Martin has so articulately outlined, flexible working is fundamental to the economy of Scotland and is the key to helping our society flourish at every level. It's also the key to establishing a healthy work-life balance for families. That's why I'm delighted that the Scottish Government's transformative changes to childcare, which are due to be trialled in Aberdeen, Edinburgh and the Scottish borders early next year, recognises that a free, high-quality, flexible childcare system helps children, parents and families the length and breadth of the country. And of course, flexible childcare ties in with flexible working. For parents, it means more ease to juggle the time between working and looking after their children, and it means they no longer have to turn down a job offer because they can't meet the nine-to-five timetable. We've certainly come a long way from the days of my mother's generation when women had to give up work when they had a baby. We only have to look at our to our Scandinavian neighbours. Sweden, like Denmark and the Netherlands, have ado has adopted a policy to improve the work-life balance of its, for its citizens. The Swedish government has taken the initiative to reduce the work-life conflict experienced mostly by women by promoting men's participation in housework and the upbringing of children. Parental leave is structured so that it encourages men to stay at home more with their newborn babies, as Gillian and Liam have mentioned uh, in their speeches. It's no coincidence that the Danes have just been voted the happiest nation on the planet due to their progressive work-life balance employment structure. And who doesn't envy the wonderful Spanish tradition of siesta time? These are examples of flexible working practices at their best. Presiding officer, the Scottish economy is one that is adapting to a modern world, as, as Gillian Martin outlined. The advance in technology has made it possible for us to work anywhere at any time. With a laptop, tablet or phone, we can access the files at work and pick up from where we left off. It's been proved beyond all doubt that giving employees the option of flexible hours is hugely beneficial both to employees and to the employers and to employers. For employers, it means a happier staff who can work in the hours they feel most motivated instead of sitting in front of a desk when, when they are tired and cannot focus. For businesses, it, mean, it means a more efficient workforce that increases overall productivity. I recently spoke at a Chamber of Commerce meeting and was asked by one member what financial help he would get from the Scottish Government to enable him to pay the living wage, about which I'd just been talking. I had to be diplomatic in my answer and explain about the expansion of small business, bonus scheme, etc. But I really wanted to ask him why he thought it was acceptable to call himself a businessman and pay less than the living wage to his employees. Presiding officer, like the living wage, Flexible working is about respecting employees and trusting them to give 100% to the job without having to compromise their family life. In short, flexible working motivates a happier workforce and has the result of benefiting everyone in society. Thank you very much. I call Richard Leonard, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you. 
uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, can I begin by thanking Gillian Martin for putting this motion down for debate. Uh, it's good to hear of employers who set a good example uh, in this area, but I have to point out uh, just how far behind we are and just how much further forward we would be, in my view, if we had greater democracy at work. Too many people swipe into work and swipe away many of the rights and freedoms which outside work they take for granted. Employment law in this country is still framed in a master-servant relationship and until we tackle that, we will be relying on the benevolence of a few enlightened uh, employers. So we need greater industrial democracy. One of the trade unions which has amongst the highest number of lower paid part-time women members is USDAW. And USDAW produces some excellent information for their members on maternity rights, paternity rights and flexible working. And so if you look at their website, you will read that anyone who has worked in the same job for 26 weeks or more uh, can ask their employer for a change in their working hours. And the employer is obliged to carefully consider the request. It is an important right, but it is not a right to flexible working. In the end, it is merely a right to request flexible working, and it does not apply to agency workers. Anyone who has worked in industry or had the privilege, as I have had the privilege, of representing working men and women know that many of these requests are turned down for, I quote, business reasons. Even when they are hard won, there is often compromise. So we need to take a fresh look at these rights and in my view, tilt the balance more in favor of the worker selling their labor and less in favor of the employer buying their labor. There should be much greater self-organization of working time so that people can collectively come up with shift patterns and a work-life balance that suits them as well as the business or service they are providing. And so part of the answer in my view lies not in weakening trade unions uh, but in strengthening them because I'll tell you that in my opinion we can have all the laws around flexibility in the world but if you don't have a trade union to enforce those laws to give life to those rights they will only exist on paper. Uh, so that's why I'm determined that whenever we talk in this parliament about the economy, jobs and fair work, trade unions are not an optional extra, but are an integral and necessary part uh, of the debate. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, today is World uh, Prematurity Day, and I want to finish uh, by paying tribute to Bliss, who do a tremendous job in advocating for change and giving practical support to families who have faced uh, the challenge of the birth of a premature baby. And yet it still is the case that there is no legal right for a mother to split or defer maternity leave uh, on the grounds of premature birth. Some women who have gone through the experience of prematurity would have liked the option of returning to work whilst their baby is in special care and take the rest of their maternity leave when he or she comes home from hospital. But at the moment, there is no right to do that. So I hope that today, uh, in this debate, uh, as part of uh, Prematurity Day, uh, that we can call uh, for uh, greater flexibility, more family-friendly policies uh, to this group of uh, families uh, especially. Because our failure to end injustices like this, our failure to transform the way workers are treated at work and the way women are treated at work especially and in society, doesn't just diminish them, it diminishes us all. Uh, and if I can uh, conclude, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, with a short quotation, uh, which I thought uh, sums up the mood and tone which I think we need to adopt. Uh, it's a quotation from Robert Tressel's Ragged Trousered Philanthropists when he said, every man or woman, I would add, every man or woman who is not helping to bring about a better state of affairs for the future is helping to perpetuate the present misery and is therefore the enemy of his or her own children. There is no such thing as being neutral. We must either help or hinder. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard. Erudite ending as usual. I call Jeremy Balfour, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Uh, you're quite right. And, and here we are in flex, I'm being too flexible. I've just ditched you. I call Ruth McGuire, sorry, to be followed by Jeremy Balfour, who'll be the last speaker. I'm needing my calories. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate my colleague Gillian Martin for bringing the important uh, topic of flexible working to the Chamber. And as we've heard, when we talk about flexible working, we can mean a number of things. It can be about a place of work, for example, home working or having a choice of locations, or other arrangements like part-time working, flexi-time, job sharing or shifts. And these arrangements, these types of arrangements, undoubtedly make an organisation a more attractive proposition for a, a more diverse range of employees. When asked by Gingerbread to identify the top three features of their ideal job, one in three single parents chose the opportunity to work flexibly. But opening up more avenues of employment doesn't just help to level the playing field for job seekers such as single parents or those with caring responsibilities. We know, and we've heard in a number of the speeches now, that um, diverse workforces are more creative and more innovative. Having a wide range of skills and experience means that organisations are more likely to design products and services for a broader customer base. And for business, that's good for their bottom line. Organisations that have fair and flexible working practices are more productive. Happier staff who feel valued are more likely to be engaged and on top of their work. And given the opportunity to work flexibly can make sure that they're working at times when they are most productive. There is, of course, the matter of health and work-life balance too. Working life doesn't come without its stresses and not all of them are limited to the workplace. For those with caring responsibilities, parents or grandparents, for example, Simply getting to work can be a bit of a battle with maybe dropping off kids at a childminder or school or nursery run to complete before even getting to the joy of the daily commute. There are also, of course, those unscheduled joys in home life. Um, parents, children or partners being ill, burst pipes, dental appointments. Flexible working can't take away all the worry and annoyance of life, but it can alleviate some of them quite greatly. And a healthier and more relaxed workforce is good for business as well as for society, with reduced sickness absence and healthy, motivated staff performing well. Presiding officer, I'll just conclude by saying that it is perfectly feasible for organisations to offer flexible ways of working in jobs at all levels, bringing benefits for both themselves and their employees. And while it's often offered as a retention tool for existing staff, flexible working is most successful when employers embed it at the heart of their organisation, designed for everyone, central to the way that they operate, and with uh, their management leading um, the cultural shift needed to make it work. Where organisations achieve this, as well as making the world of work more inclusive, which is good for society, that are benefits to both the individual employees, their families and the business or organisation. A good reason to have flexible working at the heart of our fair work agenda. And my apologies again, Ms McGuire, your face was a picture. It's told me exactly where I'd gone wrong. Uh, now it really is Jeremy Balfour. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. Again, can I, uh, like other members, thank Gillian Martin for bringing this debate to the Parliament and allowing us the opportunity to explore the important issues that it raises. Everybody everywhere seems to be busy. It feels like it affects a modern day society and the matter seems to be getting worse and worse. Interesting family friendly working research revealed that only 12% of parents in Scotland felt their work life balance was just right. 44% were unable to participate in school or nursery activities. And 40% of parents say work got in the way of them spending quality time with family, resulting in families not eating together at dinner time and pressures being placed on relationships with partners. There are of course advantages for employers and employees where there is a flexible scheme available. Flexible working practices take away the pressure on working parents to improve the work-life balance, as we've heard already from other speakers. It's good not only for the employee, but as we again have heard from other speakers' employers. But I think we can move just not only into looking at uh, mums and dads and those that have children, but also into other 
employees of companies. A couple of weeks ago, a constituent contacted me and uh, I was surprised when she said she could meet me at half past two on a Wednesday afternoon. She was working full time. She said her employer had complete flexible hours. There was no even core time within the workplace. As long as she did the hours that were required and attended the meetings that she had to go to, she could go in any time, could go away and come back. And that gave her flexibility. That must be good for people that want to be engaged within the third sector, within voluntary organisations, to give people flexibility and to trust people in that way, I think should be encouraged and should be practised that more companies should bring forward. And the saying goes, the proof of a pudding is in the eating. And research shows that employees who work for a flexible, family friend employer are, mo are more motivated to stay with that company, are more productive in their work, and will often, as we've heard, go the extra mile. And also, they are more likely to recommend that employer to be a good place of work when other people are looking to change jobs. So I am very happy to support this motion. The groups that promote flexible working practices and the employers across Scotland embracing this change. It is clearly playing an important part in providing parents and others who want to do other things with a healthy work-life balance, which is a positive impact on family life, on work and the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call on uh, Jamie Hepburn to wind up the government minister. Seven minutes or thereabouts, Thank please. Thank you very much, presiding officer, and uh, not least because of Jeremy Balfour's reference to pudding and his contribution. I'll try not to delay your calorific intake for too much longer. But can I uh, join others in thanking Gillian Martin for bringing forward uh, today's debate? Can I thank those who have uh, taken part in the debate as well? I think this has been a, a very useful, uh, of, uh, somewhat consensual uh, debate. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, of course, because I think this is uh, an agenda that uh, we are all uh, signed up to. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, Gillian Martin's motion refers to uh, Family Friendly Working Scotland, commends them for the the work they undertake, uh, rightly so. The Scottish Government is delighted to, to fund and be involved in this uh, partnership established in 2014, working alongside working families, painting across Scotland and Fathers Network Scotland, uh, indeed uh, the Minister for Childcare in early years. And I met with uh, Family Friendly uh, Working uh, Scotland uh, as recently as October the 27th. It was a very productive discussion focused on how uh, they can so continue to support employers, families, and indeed a range of uh, government uh, policies, uh, which I'll try and turn to uh, over the course of my contribution. And I certainly left uh, the meeting with my conviction reaffirmed that uh, supporting flexible working is the right thing to do, uh, for, as everyone, I think, has made the point, for employees, for employers, and for our wider uh, economy. Uh, Gillian uh, Martin and Liam Kerr were absolutely correct. I would uh, entirely concur that this is and not just an agenda for women, we must also support men in the flexible work agenda in relation to uh, fathers specifically uh, and flexible working, a, a key reason, that's a key reason why we are working with Fathers Network Scotland on the, the Year of the Dad campaign, uh, is to support that equality agenda, not only in the workplace, but at home. I don't know if it's necessary for me to do so, President Officer, but let me declare an interest as a dad uh, myself. Uh, also, it's why we have a range of uh, measures in our, our fair work agenda focused on all in uh, the workplace. Can I, if I can stick to the issue of flexibility uh, for, for parents, which is obviously a, a recurrent theme in the debate, finding the, the right balance between uh, responsibilities at home and work is increasingly challenging uh, for uh, parents. Last year, uh, Family Friendly Work in Scotland published the Modern Families Index Scotland. In that survey, 41% of parents said that work life uh, balance is becoming increasingly it's stressful. More than a quarter felt constantly torn between work and family, and over a third felt it affected family life and relationships with their partners. So it is essential that we support uh, parents to thrive. Uh, family Friendly Working Scotland makes a, a vital contribution by working alongside employers and their representative bodies to deliver high quality part time uh, posts. And of course, a key way in which this uh, government is supporting parents is through uh, early learning and childcare would be expanding provision to 1140 hours a year, which will make it easier for parents to find a solution that suits their specific needs, along with the work we're currently engaged in 
uh, ensuring that provision can be flexible to support uh, families. And it's not just parents who need support for caring uh, responsibilities. The, the Modern Families Index for Scotland found that almost 30 per cent of respondents already provided care for older people and almost 70 per cent expect to do so within the next decade while still uh, in the work environment. Family uh, Friendly Working Scotland have partnered with Carers Scotland to deliver a, a Best for Carers and Elder Care Award in 2016. Western Bathroom Council uh, won that award with Standard Life uh, highly commended as well. And as the government was supporting carers alongside uh, excellent initiatives such as a carer positive in my uh, previous role as Minister for Sport, Health Improvement and Mental Health. I was uh, very pleased to see examples of that scheme in effect. I, I recall very clearly uh, visiting uh, Scottish Gas who had wholly uh, endorsed and got behind uh, that initiative and the clear benefits for uh, those who have caring responsibilities working within their uh, organisation also uh, helped to uh, take the uh, Care of Scotland Act through uh, Parliament. I believe the the provisions which will commence uh, on the 1st of April uh, next, uh, on 2018, uh, will make a, a meaningful difference to unpaid carers, ensuring they can uh, continue to care whilst also having a, a career and uh, personal life. Uh, it remains the case that more women than men undertake caring uh, roles and therefore need to work flexibly. Uh, and there are still inequalities between male and female employment, with uh, women more likely to be in low-paid work and to be unemployed in hours worked and skills levels. That's why. Uh, we are committed to tackling the pay gap and occupational segregation. That is why we are legislating for gender balance public sector boards. That is why we are trialling a, a women returners uh, programme. There is a number of commi commitments towards that agenda. We have asked Skills Development Scotland to look very clearly at making improvements in the modern apprenticeship frameworks where there is a clear gender imbalance. It is a number of commitments made in our labour market strategy, uh, turning to the the Women Returners uh, initiative that I spoke of a few moments ago, I was very delighted to uh, announce uh, a few weeks ago funding for Equate Scotland to, to take forward the first tranche of that work to support women back into the STEM sector. Uh, indeed, earlier just this week, and this was uh, highlighted in uh, Jackie Bailey's uh, members debate, which uh, Jelly Martin also uh, took part in about supporting women in enterprise, uh, I was very happy to uh, announce a pocket of £200,000 funding for Women's Enterprise Scotland and their partners to support uh, women entrepreneurs to help grow their business and support other women to become uh, involved in enterprise. It's also why we're tackling pregnancy and maternity uh, discrimination following the, uh, the shocking final last year that one in nine mothers uh, in Britain reported being dismissed, made compulsory redundant or treated so poorly uh, they felt they had uh, to quit. I'll be chairing a working group on this issue. The group's uh, remit will include developing guidelines for uh, employers, the uh, group will meet for the first time uh, next month. I'll be very happy to keep uh, Palm abreast of uh, the work uh, it undertakes going forward. We've invited a range of uh, members onto it. I'm happy to say that Nikki Slowey, uh, Director of uh, Family Friendly Working Scotland, has accepted an invitation to be a member of that working uh, group. Our commitments uh, are also underpinned by uh, our labour market strategy that I mentioned earlier, uh, President Officer. It sets a, a clear uh, direction how we'll tackle inequalities for for women and other underrepresented groups. We will also continue to work very closely with the uh, Fair Work uh, Convention to promote their fair framework to uh, employers with a, a focus on engaging directly with particular sectors, promote the benefits of paying uh, the living wage equally to, to men and women. Of course, we also provide funding for the Poverty Alliance for the accreditation uh, scheme for uh, the living wage. We now have 600 uh, or more uh, uh, living wage accredited employers in Scotland, some 20 per cent of the uh, UK uh, total, and uh, it allows me the chance, President Officer, of course, to urge all MSPs to sign up to become a living wage uh, 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 champion. And of course, we have the business pledge as well. We have added two explicit references to family friendly and flexible working uh, in the Scottish uh, business pledge just earlier uh, this year. Uh, let me uh, conclude, uh, President Officer, by saying that it's clear, I think, from the uh, the tenor of uh, this debate and from what we hear out there that employees will increasingly seek out uh, employers who provide the flexible working options uh, they need. And in that uh, regard, uh, given that we do not have control over employment law, what we need to do is we need to reach out. And I thought it was very uh, interesting, Richard Leonard rightly made the point, in many ways right now we rely on uh, the en enlightened employers to make this offering. Well, what we need to do, and I think a number of uh, members made this point, is we need to explain 
to employers why it's in their own enlightened self-interest to get behind this agenda because we know with flexible working it's not only good for the employee because it's good for the employer because we see more motivated staff who feel valued with better retention rates reduced absenteeism and increased productivity so it's good for the employer as well that's good for our economy and that's why this is an agenda this Scottish Government takes very seriously indeed Thank you very much Minister that concludes this debate and I suspend the meeting until 2.30